Thank you, Ashley. Thank you, Ashley and Jared, for inviting me to this presentation. Uh, it's going to be a pleasure to present some of the work we've done collaborating together on site at Shuttle Yuk. And I just want to say I'm not a conservator, I'm an archaeologist. So I just like acknowledge this sort of, you know, point of view and perspective. And, uh, and from the point of view of an archaeologist, I'm going to try to reflect a bit on the intersections between archaeology and conservation. Um, so I'm going to... Let's see. Fantastic. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, so um, I was just thinking about like the um, uh, the uh, differences between and the intersection between archaeology and conservation. And what this is usually said is that archaeology is destructive, while conservation is conservative. So they are like they have opposite impacts uh, onto the material remains of the past. But uh, what is not often acknowledged are other, more complex ways of interaction between archaeology and conservation. And what something I'm really interested in is their relative impact into the interpretation of material culture. And for example, I mean, as Frank Matero said, um, uh, archaeological sites are constructed by archaeology, but also as conservation choices because conservation treatments also affect the materiality and the visualization of material remains. Um, and this is something that I'm going to look at in, with the specific example of architectural paintings from the Neolithic site of Chotolyuk. Um, and on the second part of my presentation, I'm going to talk about some more methodological um, um, issues about how to conciliate the um, you know the necessity of conserving archaeological artifacts for public presentation, and how can we con reconcile that with also arche archaeological research and to advance our interpretation on the same um, on the same uh, artifacts. So I'm gonna start uh, saying a few words about uh, the research material we're talking about. Uh, we are at Yuk in central Turkey. It's a Neolithic site um, spanning between 7100 BC and 5900 BC. And uh, um, it, painting is ubiquitous on site, uh, pigment is really everywhere, and especially on plaster um, features. Uh, it's an earthen architecture site, so all the plaster they use is mar, on fire mar plaster. And the paintings are found on many different uh, archaeological architectural features. So that's why I don't like to talk about wall paintings, because paintings are found on benches, on platforms, on floors, on uh, uh, wall reliefs. Um, and uh, so far, they say we have about 250 paintings estimated. Um, and uh, um, so this is the largest repertoire in the Neolithic Near East. And something I want to say is that we have a variety of iconographic motifs. Uh, the most common is certainly uh, just red, solid red painted walls, but we also have geometric patterns. We have anthropomorphic, especially hand motifs, and we have zoomorphic, some especially from the previous excavations, and also some zoomorphic and geometric uh, combinations. Um, so that's, yeah, that's, I guess enough for that. And now I'm going to a bit scarily talk about conservation at Chapalayuk, given that Ashley and Jared have been working at the site uh, doing precisely that are here. Um, but I'm just going to, uh, I think it's important to say a few words about this. And please, like, jump in and correct me if I say anything wrong. But um, so basically, it's very complicated <laughs> because. Uh, Mar plaster is unfired, so it's uh, it's a very fragile material. And once it's sealed under the ground, it tends to reach a balance with the surrounding soil. But once it's excavated, um, the problems come in because um, uh, mar plaster suffer especially from uh, changes in temperature and humidity. And this is what we have a lot. Something that we have a lot in central Anatolia. It's a plateau, so we have. In a continental climate, so we have very, very uh, cold winters and very hot summers. And also during the uh, between the day and the night, there is a lot of variation in humidity and temperature. This has been further ex exacerbated from these uh, um, um, protective shelters that have actually kind of worsened these conditions 
and uh, um, and of course it goes without saying that since paintings are on marplaster, whatever affects marplaster also affects the paintings. And something that affects specifically the paintings and that uh, James Mellard, who started excavating a Chateau in the 1960s, had soon lead to soon to realize the painful way is that when exposed to direct sunlight, uh, the, paint, the pigment fades or changes color. And this happens also in controlled environment, even if at a slower rate. So how did a conservator like deal with this complexity and this uh, such a fragile and unstable material? So in the 1960s, um, especially, I mean, um, they were using especially PVA, polyvinyl acetate emulsions, to treat the paintings, and then I know that I see like, <laughs> yeah, it's nice. and then they would just like remove them and ship them to Ankara to the Museum of Anatolian Civilizations in Ankara, where most of them are still conserved and some of them are on display. Uh, in the 1990s, with when a new project started, um, there was a bit of a different approach that was um, that was put in place and emphasis was put more on in situ preservation of paintings as long as possible using uh, different acrylic solutions like aqueous polymers am i right yes um and and then there's been uh, done a bit of experimentation in using also uh, more sustainable materials like earth, earth renders and and other things so it has been a, a bit of evolution and ashley is now working on uh, kind of evaluating um, these previous uh, approaches to conservation, uh, but in sometimes these uh, these techniques can only could only uh, slow down the process of deterioration. So in many cases, painting had to finally be removed from the site and put in more controlled environment. So it's um, it's not a it's a very difficult case, and paintings are definitely very very unstable and fragile. Um, even though conservation approaches have been developed quite a lot at the site. And now it comes to, I want to come to the central node of this um, talk, which is the problem, I believe, uh, the impact of conservation and archaeological methods onto the interpretation of Chattelewick paintings. In view of the fragile and unstable materiality of paintings, as well as the earth and architecture of Chattelewick as a whole, conservation approaches, despite using a variety of different approaches and techniques, focused on the consolidation of paintings in order to enable their long conservation and therefore their public presentation. Um, but I believe that through the process involved in conservation treatments and museum practices, paintings have been transformed from the fragile ephemeral entities encountered by the archaeology and conservation professionals working on site uh, into stable, durable objects, ideally meant uh, to last for eternity in accordance uh, with the modernistic logic underlying conservation as well as archaeology as disciplines. Uh, this illusion of durability, I believe, has, uh, has been produced um, by freezing up multi-layer multi painted, painted sequences uh, at one precise moment in time, thus rendering static something that was originally ever-changing and dynamic. And something that I maybe forgot to mention is that uh, paintings such as Luke are in many cases multi-layered and they are like sort of sandwiched in between a number of white plaster layers. As you can see here, maybe they are like, oh, so... Oh. Can I do this? No. Um, so there are many white, uh, white layers, very thin, and then we've got the, just this painting right in the middle. And what we see in a museum is actually, um, and treated by conservation, is just basically uh, a plastic sequence frozen up at one moment in time. And uh, further excavation in the case is not possible. So we're actually losing the information of what was before that. And uh, I believe that we are also losing uh, the idea of uh, um, this continuous curation, this continuous transformation that uh, paintings were going through uh, in the Neolithic. And, uh, and this is part, we can interpret that also as an attempt of Neolithic people to deal with the very uh, fragile materiality of these uh, things um, through continuous curation. So they were just like replastering, repainting continuously to get the thing going. And which is something actually similar that we do today through conservation, even though in a very different um, uh, framework. 
So the question is like, um, oh, another case that I wanted to talk about briefly is that in many cases painting have uh, cases of original repair. If you see these like um, areas of upper reliefs, there are actually parts where paintings are retouched and uh, replastered and repainted over as a way of the, uh, repairing the painting as well. So they really have our dynamic uh, ever-changing entities as archaeological research has shown in the past few years. Um, so the question then is, given that we have this um, tension, we have a tension in terms of conserving as, as opposed as destroying archaeologically things, but we also have a contrast in terms of interpretation. Archaeology, archaeological research, and conservation treatments here are leading to opposing interpretations of the same archaeological object. So um, shifting to a more methodological point of view, how do we reconcile that? Um, so, and that's where my own dissertation research, research comes in, uh, trying to talk, reevaluate re um, the um, archaeological architectural painting from Chateau and um, in the next few slides, I'm going to talk about a methodology that I've been using um, to sort of um, deal with these issues and, uh, and to do an archaeological study of uh, architectural painting in a way that it doesn't destroy paintings and in a way that it's sustainable in terms of conservation, but also in a way that it's um, able to advance the interpretation. And I want to say that uh, these methods, especially those ones that um, um, actually um, sort of uh, affect the preservation of paintings themselves and all have all been negotiated on site uh, with Ashley especially um, in order to you know um, through two seasons of field work at Chateauuk in order to you know just you know do my research without completely destroying them or so one of the things that I've done is cross-sectional analysis so I've been taking um, block samples of plaster sequences and, and then look at them under a microscope to see uh, whether there are painted layers. Like for example, there's one here and there's two more on the surface and then creating this sort of uh, um, data sheet where I say like how many paintings I have there. And uh, it's a, it has limitation because I'm not able to see the whole painting. I can just see the section of it. Uh, but it's also con sustainable in terms of conservation because it's it's uh, it's not non-invasive, but at least I I take some, just a little sample of a uh, plaster um, um, sequence. So it's um, it's it's a way of avoid excavating the whole thing, but still retain some sort of information about it. And one okay, doesn't want to work now. And another thing that I've done is a small scale uh, tar targeted excavation. So um, I took small pieces of painting and uh, I wanted to uh, see what was underneath. So I was like excavating them with a surgical scalpel and then, um, you know, recording um, stage by stage um, the um, what was underneath. And so, for example, here I saw like a geometric painting on top and then I found out orange red a layer and then a dark red layer and finally another leftovers of another geometric so it's uh, it's a way of um, understanding better the stratigraphy of a multi-layer painting without actually excavating it completely again and uh, I've also been using some uh, 3d um, uh, and photogrammetry techniques um, and it's been very important for me, not only as a way of off-site visualization, because like paintings decay over time and I don't have access to them all the time because they are stored in Turkey safely. So it's a way for me to actually visualize them off-site in a way that is better than um, just photographs. But also it allowed me to look at surface modification and surface anomalies um, the, in a way that is better than just simple photographs. Um, so I've been using both 3D modeling for that um, and uh, uh, reflectance transformation imaging uh, known as RTI um, for that purpose. And uh, I wanted at this point, if I can, 
to show um, a little video that I did um, and I'm gonna talk in the meanwhile about that. So um, I also use virtual reconstruction um, in order to show all sorts of audiences like how the paintings actually change a lot throughout the lifespan of the house. So how, for example, this is one of the buildings at Chateau Yuk that I've been um, working on with Grand Coast Artist Media doing the 3D modeling. And basically uh, the video shows this is different phases of painting in the same building. So this is the first phase with one view from one side of the building and one view uh, from the other side of the building. And basically um, it's a way of showing how paintings are very um, um, ever-changing and they really, they're not static things, they kind of change throughout the um, lifespan of a, of a building. So that's why we call this video the life cycle of a painted wall, uh, of, of a painted house at Chateau Yuk. And this video has been finished this morning, uh, so it's all very <laughs> recent. It came out of a collaboration I did with um, Grant Cox at Southampton uh, in the last few days. Um, so hopefully um, I see it as a counter balance to the sort of like conservation induced interpretation of paintings as stable, fixed, durable objects by showing how in the same, in the very same feature, for example, these, pl these uh, platforms, um, there was a continuous change of motifs, colors, there was a lot going on. And this is something that we see in our section when we see so many different uh, paintings uh, and at one point it was white and then was painted again. It was all very dynamic. But I'm gonna um, go on because I have a couple more slides and um, something else. Um, oh no, okay, let's just do it this way. Something else I wanted to talk about is um, ethno-archaeological and experimental approaches. We've been uh, working on that um, actually in the last two seasons with the conservation team, uh, trying to, and we had to build a replica house of the site. And uh, so we had to do all the Maverick architectural process. So we've been helped by local people in the local village who have the skill of this way of building. So we've been like involved in the process, both of creating um, plaster mixtures and also painting walls and you know, doing all sorts of things. And uh, it has been great because it gives, it gives you an embodied uh, knowledge of the material itself, which I think it's really helpful to understand how people were you know, playing with the same material in the past. And I think that's very useful um, to have this experience from both an archeological and a conservation uh, point of view. And uh, uh, let me just remark a few points as I um, finish up. And one is that um, it might seem actually, I mean, um, taken for granted, but um, it's very important, I believe, if we want to really create a, a conversation between the two different to have specialists working together on site and really negotiating um, solutions as work go on on a daily basis in a sort of ongoing site-specific collaboration, which I found really helpful. And, uh, and also I wanted to remark that since archaeological artifacts and sites are produced through archaeological as much as conservation practices, a truly reflexive approach in archaeology should consider the impact of both in the process of interpretation. So how conservation treatments, archaeological techniques sort of um, what the, what's their impact in terms of interpretation of public presentation and how can we account for that? And then uh, something that I found very important has become a very important um, you know, feature of my uh, dissertation is just using a very diversified um, um, methodology, um, especially when dealing with something this complex, uh, this fragile, uh, this partially accessible. Uh, I found that just doing a few different things and not only in terms of research, but also in terms of presentation, um, it's particularly valuable. And I think it also, um, it also improves 
uh, and enhances sustainability in terms of conservation. And that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you.